So, um, hi everyone, welcome to ArtsFest Online and to the next instalment in our series of Disability History Month talks. Tonight we will be joined by gallerist Jennifer Gilbert. Jennifer will be talking about how her Man Manchester gallery supports disabled and neurodivergent artists. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A box or the chat and we'll go through them as we go along. Um, we ask you not to share any private information in the chat and the Q&A as this is a public platform and the session is also being recorded. So with all that said, welcome Jennifer and over to you. Great, well, hi everyone. I thought I'd start briefly by describing myself, for anyone that might need it. I am a white woman in my mid thirties with bright red hair, a fringe, and today I'm wearing a dark green top. And so yeah, hi, I'm Jennifer. I wanted to start with a very short snippet of a film about an artist that I work with. So I'm just going to share my screen um, for you to see a film about Terence Wilde. Terence is a man who is nearly 60. He classes himself as an adult survivor. And he describes his work as response, different responses to periods in his life and personal situations that he finds himself in. And he says that he tries to make, he makes art to try and make sense of his life and to help him heal. So let me just share. Hopefully this will work if I make it full screen. Um, often these drawings are a way of me keeping myself safe, balanced. I was in hospital in the middle of my first year of my degree course because I just, I basically didn't like myself and I didn't like myself because I was gay. So I went into hospital to have ECT treatment to make me normal um, and they wouldn't let me have it, um, thank God. And it's a picture about ache and heartache. So it's got sort of a merman, which was my identity, um, with no arms. So I can't really swim. And I'm not very good on ground. So that's probably how I felt about myself. So it says, give me ECT so I can be normal, so I can make myself go away. Luckily, I didn't get the ECT treatment, but I did get the embroidery outfit. I've been my own therapist, if you like, through my work. My black and white work is my private work, and my colour work is often the work that I used to make a living from. So from a perspective of an adult survivor, that provides the narrative to the majority of my black and white work. So although it might be a pin negative or a bit despondent in nature, it's actually full of hope because I've managed to use some of the bad stuff that's happened to me and I haven't given in. And actually my creativity is partly formed by a lot of the demons that I still have. I'd rather stay up late doing a, a drawing than drink half a bottle of vodka or ring Samaritans or go to A&E because I I feel bad about myself so it's just a, a, it's like a proper healing tool and I actually have embraced it in that way in my life and probably 90% of my life is my art practice there must be lots of us out there that have our own stuff going on own bits of darkness that we have to share and if you put your soul into your work then that's what makes you an artist great so that's Terence, one of the artists that I work with. I'm now going to share my um, presentation for today. Hopefully you can all see this. So who am I? My name is Jennifer and I studied as an artist in London at Central St. Martins quite a few years ago now. And when I was at university, I found out about something called outsider art, which some people may or may not know about. And my dissertation was all written about that. And from that point onwards, I became really interested in how art is used as a healing tool um, for people to process what's going on and to improve their health and well-being. So from university, I went and did a foundation course in um, art therapy, which I liked and I didn't like. Um, I was going on to go and do a master's in it, but I decided that um, after taking part in this foundation course and taking part in art therapy myself, I didn't like how prescriptive it, it became. And I know that it works for some people and it's very important to them. 
But I found this master's then that was art, health and well-being, which was a much broader than art therapy. And part of it was looking at art as a therapeutic experience. And then it was much broader than that. And we looked at unconscious to conscious theories and many other things. So after getting my master's um, degree, I then went to become the manager of a national arts charity for seven years, where I put on exhibitions in mainstream galleries um, and museums all around the country, trying to challenge what they were showcasing in their spaces. But given that it was such a large charity, I decided that I wanted to do something much smaller where I was working with a smaller number of artists, really dedicating myself to what those artists want to achieve, where they wanted their art to go, and really trying to grow their career as artists. So in 2017, I set up the Jennifer Lauren Gallery, which is the first point on this uh, presentation. Through that, I am uh, a curator. I've never trained as a curator, but I have curated many exhibitions um, across many years now. And I feel like you can just, I know curator is such a big thing, but you kind of learn as you go and you learn all the things that are involved in it. So it's not just putting an exhibition into the space. It's all the research that goes into that. It's writing or the interpretation. It's everything that goes into um, bringing that all together. Just going to bring up. Uh, the question. I didn't do a PhD, I did a master's for um, Adisa that's asked a question. I'm also a freelance producer um, on the side, so I work with disabled artists and self-taught artists, um, so I'll talk about that a bit later on. And then these three last things I think are, are important to mention. So I set up my gallery to support a certain uh, group of artists, which is disabled, neurodivergent and deaf artists. Um, and through my gallery, I work with a, a whole range of artists all over the world, in Germany, in Austria, in America, across the UK. I have quite a few artists that I work with in Japan. And some of them have mental health issues. Some are autistic. Um, there's a whole breadth of people that I work with, and some are just self-taught and they exist on the margins of society. Um, and then an advocate and a friend I think this is kind of what sets me apart from lots of people that class themselves as art dealers in this field, because I'm a very big ad advocate for the artists that I support and work with, and not just those, but other disabled artists across the UK and working out of supported studios. And to me, the friend aspect is probably the most important, especially with the artists that I work with across the UK that I um, have the same language as me, me being in English as our main language. I feel like I, try and become a friend to these artists. I really want to respect them, get to know them. I like to hang out with them as much as possible, stay in touch with them, check that they're okay, um, and really care for them. And that's something that's really very important to me. Let's see if I can change slides. So this is me in one of my exhibitions. Um, this is actually the biggest exhibition that I did, but we'll come back to this later on. <laughs> so through my gallery, I put on pop-up exhibitions. I normally hire spaces out in London, even though I'm based in Manchester, because I can't afford to have an actual gallery space um, at present. So I like to hire out spaces. Um, it's very expensive to hire out spaces in London and many of them are not very accessible. Lots of them have steps to get in and they're quite often old buildings, the ones that you can hire, which is quite frustrating when you work with the artists that I work with. So the spaces that are accessible tend to be slightly more expensive, which is a pity. So I put on pop-up exhibitions and while I have the exhibitions on, I like to do a series of events. I like to have workshops, artist talks. I try to make them as accessible as possible. Um, the, the workshops all are led by disabled artists, which is very important to me. I also do training and mentoring, which we'll come back to later on. And if you know me well, you know that if I put on an exhibition, I tend to match my outfit to whatever's going on. So this was a black and white exhibition. So I had black and white nails, black and white outfit. Um, it's just something that makes me happy when I put on an exhibition. So here's the artists, um, some of the artists that I work with to give you kind of a flavor. They're all completely unique and very different. I currently work with 28 artists um, on a one-to-one -one basis from all over the world. 
as I mentioned, there's quite a few from Japan. The first artist you can see here on the left is Terence Wilde, who just watched the film about. Terence's black and white work is all to do with his mental health and all to do with being an adult survivor. Mark making plays a really big part of his artistic process. Um, and his work um, varies in scale from really small to really quite large drawn pieces. He also is self-taught in ceramics and he makes ceramic objects that he then draws onto with how he's feeling, uh, which you can see on my website. The second artist here is probably the most well-known artist that I work with. He's called Sunichi Sawada. He's a Japanese autistic artist um, who's nearly 40 and he works out of a studio in Japan and he's worked there since he was 20 so basically for nearly 20 years and he's completely self-taught um, he doesn't speak so no one knows what these creatures are all about why he makes them he doesn't have any inspiration in front of him when he makes them he goes into a little hut in the mountains in Japan and he spends about four days making each creature which are then left to dry out and then they're fired in a wood kiln, which is a very unique process to Japan and takes a very long time for the um, firing to happen. It's not just like putting in an electric kiln. It's a three day, um, all day, all night process to keep the kiln at the same temperature to get this effect that um, is created on these ceramics. And the third artist here on the right is Cara McWilliam, who is the newest artist that I've started working with. She is a local artist to me in Manchester who's completely self-taught. She has chronic illness. She's mostly housebound, but she creates these most beautiful drawings using watercolour pencil, of which you can see more of on my website. For me, when I work with artists, it's really important that um, barriers are put in place, but also um, there's contracts in place with either the artist or a family member or a studio if the artist isn't able to give their consent. So that um, they're aware what I'll do, I'm aware what they'll do, and so that it's a legally binding document just so everything is kind of covered. And I don't want anyone to ever feel like um, they're not protected in the situation. Um, there's also safeguarding policies and that sort of thing in place. So here are two of the artists that I also work with. On the left is Kate Bradbury and on the right is Chris Neat. These are two shows that I did in London, which were short pop-up shows again. I try to do them to the highest quality that I can in the spaces that I hire out. So everything is professionally framed where it needs to be. There's vinyl text put on the wall, so I don't want it to come across as though it's anything community arts, or I don't want them these artists to be seen as anything other than artists in their own right. So there's always booklets produced for each show, and everything is um, to a really high standard, and again, very accessible with large print text and BSL and that sort of thing. And since I've began, it really is a very supportive family thing. My, my parents always come to these events. They help me run them. They help me um, serve the drinks at them. It is very much a family affair because I do this by myself and they're very supportive of what I do. And I'm very appreciative that they come and do that. So if you ever come to one of my events, you always seem to get to meet my parents. They're always chatting to everyone there. They're very passionate um, about what we do as well. That probably also sets me aside from other people and I'm not afraid to admit that. Another thing that's really important to me is uh, making films about the artists that I work with. So you've just seen a snippet of Terence's film. Uh, to the left is a, a little uh, older lady called Valerie and that was a, a shot from an exhibition that she had in London last year. And so I really am passionate that where possible, the artist's voice is recorded. Um, so you could really hear from the artist's perspective and their point of view, what they're trying to get across with their artwork. But I have also made some other films more recently where if the artist is unable to communicate exactly what they want to communicate, a facilitator or family member is also part of the film to kind of give you a bit more information about that artist practice, which again is very important for me. And again, these are all on my website and are all subtitled where needed. So I mentioned earlier that accessibility is really very important to me. And I think this stems back to 
um, whilst I was doing my degree, I was working with a couple of different community-based groups. And one of them was a group of schizophrenic artists. And one of them was artists uh, with learning disabilities and other artists in the community that were really isolated. I've also worked in a day center. So I really realized the importance of personalization and working very carefully and considered with each person that I work with. <coughs> and many of them, um, especially learning disabled artists, often use Easy Read. So on my websites and other, other presentations that I give, I like to produce Easy Read documents so that people that can't read big bodies of text and really need things in simplified formats with image and small pieces of simple text um, are very important to me. You'll also see, um, hopefully you can see them hovering over. My website has an accessibility widget on it called You Access. And if you click on this particular widget here, it brings up a menu and you can change the color of the text on the website. It can highlight links in other colors. You can change it to a dyslexic font. It's basically trying to make my website more accessible to lots of different people. Other access features. If we click across, um, BSL, like I said, I work with this really wonderful artist, a deaf artist in Bristol called Rebecca Vaughan. And on my website and other websites that I've built, I have commissioned her to produce BSL versions of all longer pieces of text. So this is a new website that I've done called Shift, and she's produced a, a video that explains what Shift is. And then on another section of the website, she's produced one about that. If I do exhibitions on a solo artists or something, she then produces me a BSL version about the exhibition and then a BSL that explains the artist separately. So for me, it's very important that um, deaf audiences are catered for because they're very rarely catered for on lots of big platforms, which I'll talk about slightly later on. And again, you can listen to the text. So I've recorded myself as cringe as that is. I've recorded myself reading all the text because a few artists I work with would prefer to listen to it as opposed to read it. And then you can kind of click on things where the easy reads are and it pops up as a PDF if you need it. So back to exhibitions. So this is Monochromatic Minds. I wrote to the Arts Council and got some funding to create this exhibition, which was only on for 10 days in London um, before lockdown last year. I really wish it was on for longer, but as I mentioned, it's quite expensive. And Monochromatic Minds is the biggest ever show of black and white work from around the world made by disabled and self-taught artists. So there were 61 artists, some working out of studios, some that were isolated in their homes, some that are just completely self-taught. There was a whole range of different styles of art, some ceramics, some textiles, some drawings on flints from the sort of like end of, well, 1800 and I can't remember what the date was now, Gwyneth Rowland's absolutely exquisite pieces of work. Um, and so I put it all together. I framed it all really beautifully. I produced a really lovely book with some essays in it and each, each page was dedicated to a different artist as well. The works were for sale. I had an audio tour where I borrowed some discovery pens. I'm not sure if anyone's ever heard of them but basically you can program them to have audio on them and you go around and you can tap it on the circle on the wall and listen to an audio description um, of that particular piece of work. So I set that up for audiences that needed that, that were coming to the show. There was large print text available. I did a whole series of talks um, that were in person and then online, I did some separate talks with other artists that weren't able to make it to the exhibition. So that really was trying to share the artist's voice. And then two different disabled artists in the exhibitions both ran workshops for me um, within the community with members of the public. One was a ceramics based workshop and one was a drawing workshop. And you can kind of see in this picture here, there's a chair and you can kind of make one out in the corner here. I also commissioned four artists that were in the show to do something to a chair so that not only was it a piece of art, but also it was a resting place. And I encouraged people with signs by it that if they needed to sit down within the exhibition space, they were more than welcome to sit 
on this chair if they needed to take a rest, which again is something that's quite important in exhibition spaces. Let's see if we can scroll up. The next one is some installation photos of an exhibition that I did earlier this year in July and August. So I was very fortunate to appear on the Talk Art podcast. Now Talk Art is a podcast done by the actor Russell Tovey and the gallerist Robert Diamond. And they interview all sorts of artists, emerging artists, very famous artists, and other people within the art world, some curators, some other art dealers. And I couldn't quite believe it, but they asked me to appear on it and I've now appeared on it twice. And following that, a few really wonderful things came out of it. And this exhibition was one of them. So this was at Flowers Gallery, which is a contemporary art gallery in Mayfair on Cork Street. And the director of this gallery contacted me after hearing me on this podcast and was just like, you sound really wonderful. I'd love it if we could do something together and maybe you could do something in my gallery space, Flowers Gallery. It's been going for over 50 years now. They, this is something quite new to them. So I put a proposal together with Russell Tovey from the podcast to showcase six mostly self-taught artists from around the world within their gallery space. And it was phenomenal to say the least. It was so wonderful to be able to program this on a street like Cork Street in Mayfair um, and just put it out there as a contemporary art show. And we had this huge muscly character by a lady called Miss Ladies in the window, which completely stopped people in their tracks. And again, access was really important to us. So this particular gallery, you could get into the ground floor level, but then it was only stairs to get downstairs. So me and Russell recorded a video which appeared on a screen on the ground floor level and also this video appeared on the website, which then showed views of what was downstairs and talked about the different artists that you might not have been able to see, even though we put both artists on both levels. So that it really did make it um, um, inclusive of the people that weren't able to get down the stairs and also the people that weren't able to get to the space itself which given the times that we live in, this probably needs to be continued by a lot of places now. I've always done virtual tours of my exhibitions in a very accessible way, and I'm hoping that other people will continue doing them too. We also had a BSL tour and things like that. And it really did challenge some of their very traditional audiences that go to spaces like this to show, you know, they'd come in and they'd look at the artwork and they'd be like, well, this is fantastic. And then it's only afterwards that we might have introduced, you know, this is Susan, she's an autistic 70 year old woman that lives in New Zealand. So everything was looked at as art first and foremost, which for me is really very important. And so the feedback on this was really extraordinary and to challenge the stereotypes that some people had was also very important for me. I also take part in art fairs. So I hang everything myself. I man them myself because I told you I work by myself. Occasionally a friend comes to help me if they're able to. But um, the one on the left is my booth at the Outsider Art Fair. The one on the right is a booth at Drawing Now, which is a contemporary drawing fair in Paris. So I'm trying to split myself across the two but I don't ever say that I work with outsider artists. They are just artists to me and I would never describe them in a way that they might feel was derogatory or anything like that to them. So I'm hopefully going to be going back to um, New York in February to do another art fair, but who knows with what's going on now. <laughs> I should also mention that whenever I do these things, I always think about the artists that I'm working with and um, trying to do everything with their best interests at heart and never putting them into situations where I think it's unsuitable for them. So lots of the artists I work with might appear in external shows, but I would have really thought about the opportunity and discussed it with the artist or their representative um, if they're unable to have a conversation with me. This is just a photo from one of the workshops. This is Terence, as you've seen, and he led a workshop at uh, Submit to Love, which is a group in London that works with people with acquired brain injuries. And he ran a really wonderful workshop with them and everyone got really involved and it was a wonderful event. But then he also runs workshops just for um, 
the general public, not just for disability cha um, charities. This is to showcase the other side of what I do. So I said that online things were very important to me. So this on the left is an online talk about a wonderful artist called Nigel Kingsbury that I did with uh, his facilitator, Charlotte, because unfortunately Nigel has now passed away, but he was a very big part of a studio in London for several years. And he appeared in my black and white show, Monochromatic Minds. So we were celebrating some of the artists and she gave a talk about Nigel and his practice. And on the right is a workshop over Zoom. So as things start to open up again, I'm really keen that uh, talks and workshops still happen online, as well as online exhibitions. All throughout lockdown, I was doing online exhibitions. I didn't do them where you walk into the space and you walk around because I found them really hard to navigate those programs. And I thought if I'm finding this really hard to navigate, I really do wonder the people that I'm trying to target how difficult they would find it. So mine are more like very beautifully laid out on the page where you can click on the works and just see them bigger and the series of information and little films and stuff dotted in. And for me, that just makes it way more accessible and that sort of thing. Just checking no one's written anything that I need to reply to. If you do have any questions at any point, please just pop them in and, and I am very happy to answer anything. So yeah, as I stressed, it's very important to uh, keep with the online things for anyone that is still shielding or anyone that is unable to leave their house for medical reasons or anything it's really important to keep the two programs going as much as possible so that everyone can feel that they're a part of what is happening so I thought I'd talk about a few other projects that I'm involved in Art Atal is one of those projects I'm just going to turn my notes over in case I need to glance at them this was launched in April this year. It's a digital inclusive platform, curated platform that commissions and presents collaborations between artists from supported studios, artists, peers and arts professionals. So it was set up by myself, a curator in London called Lisa Slominski and by Arts Project Australia, which is a supported studio in Australia. And it was their curator Sim that set it up. And we got initial funding from the Arts Council in Australia, as well as um, ASUP, which is another Australia based organisation. And more recently, we've had some funding from DFAT, which is linked to the British Council. So this whole platform is a digital based platform and it really exists to pair or to support artists working out of studios or neurodivergent intellectually and learning disabled artists. And so there's several different parts, as you can see from this thing um, here, there's several different things that we do. So peer to peer, we um, pair an artist working from a supported studio with a contemporary artist in the other country. And in the moment it's just happening between the UK and Australia. And we pay them a fee and they work together for however long they want to work together. So normally it's about six to eight weeks. And sometimes they work on individual pieces, sometimes they work on things they send to each other and then the other person works on digitally or things in the post um, and that sort of thing. It's a really wonderful um, collaboration that's happening. They meet each week over Zoom where possible, which is sometimes quite difficult with an 11 hour time difference. <laughs> but so far we seem to have made it work. Another big thing that comes out of this is writing. So we understand that for a lot of uh, neurodivergent intellectually learned disabled artists, they don't often get write, written about in a critical sense. So we're commissioning um, celebrated writers to look at the artist's practice and to write a critical piece of work about their practice and to compare them with other artists within the contemporary, as opposed to them being written about as a community group or something like that. So we're really trying to raise the profile and reputation of these artists. Another thing um, you'll see in the top left, there's something called Antidote here. So we pair artists from supported studios with big collections of art. So the first one was an artist um, called Michael in Australia working out of a studio. And we paired him with the Cranford collection, which is a huge collection in London of contemporary art. Um, 
and they worked together over a period of, a, of um, several weeks. Michael looked at their collection and pulled out pieces that he felt an affinity with and then wrote a short piece of text, put together a beautiful booklet, which is on the website, working with a graphic designer as well. Um, and then raising, you know, bringing together his ideas of that collection and why he brought together those pieces. And he had several uh, conversations with the curator as it was going. So lots of it is also about skill sharing. And as I said, raising the profile of these artists. And the website is at the bottom for anyone that might want to look at that. Something that only launched on Friday uh, last week, which I'm super excited about. I got some funding again on the back of the podcast, which is probably just at the start of lockdown last year from an organization that really wanted to support me in something that I was very passionate about. And for a long time now, I've been passionate about learning disabled artists and how I feel that their work isn't being documented, well, learn disabled and neurodivergent artists, how their work isn't being documented to uh, the same standard as just disabled artists. So there's something called NDACA, which is the National Disability Arts Collection and Archive. And it mainly um, is an archive of disabled artists work and the disability arts movement. And I believe there's only one learning disabled artists work that features in that. So for me, there's so many artists working out of supported studios that are doing incredible work that is just starting to be recognized but really needs the correct documentation and really needs its profile to be raised. So I got some funding to set up a project called SHIFT, which is about shifting attitudes, shifting conversations, everything that the word SHIFT is all about. And so I've made films about eight learning disabled artists in the UK, which you'll be able to see on the website. There's a subtitle version of the film and a BSL version of the film, which, as I mentioned earlier, is very important to me. There's also images of the artist's work, their biography. There's also a separate section called conversations where I've started to have conversations with some of these artists about how they see themselves and how they think other people see them. And also the reasons why they think curators don't program their work into mainstream gallery spaces. And something Thompson, that's one of the artists made a really important point on the conversation I had with him that curators are often too often looking at um, your academic background and aren't really looking enough at, you know, just your art in general. And so he kind of makes the point, as you know, I do a lot of research for my art. I spend a lot of time looking into things as do other artists, but just because I don't have the same CV and the same art credentials as everybody else, it means I'm automatically excluded from having my work in these spaces. So I feel like he's made a really important point there that I think needs to be followed up and challenged with lots of institutions. So do take a look at this website, hear what the artists have got to say. Um, and if you want to be part of the conversation, then please do get in touch with me because I'm really open to having further conversations about this. Another aspect of what I do is supporting disabled artists, which is what I said earlier. So I, I work with 28 artists with my gallery but also do freelance work on the side. So these are two artists in particular that I got funding for. James Lake on the right with these cardboard sculptures is a disabled sculptor. He is absolutely phenomenal. I helped him to get some project funding from the Arts Council because I also am an access support writer and help people with their funding applications that would find it difficult otherwise. And he got some project funding to really develop himself as an artist. So for years, he's kind of created his art on the side and then had to do like community workshops and other things to keep himself going. So we got this funding so that he could really spend time to see what was possible as an artist in his own right. So he had lots of mentoring, professional development. We completely rebuilt his website to really showcase his artwork and what he does. And as you can see, he's bloody amazing. <laughs> it's all I can say about him. He's also just had Wired uh, contact him and make a film about him, which is absolutely amazing as well. So I'm really, really happy for him. The artist on the left, George J. Harding, is a Bristol-based um, painter, a disabled painter, who I got some Develop Your Creative Practice funding for from the Arts Council. And he's been on a journey 
traveling around along the southwest coastal path um, building up his plein air painting skills and so we've just created an online exhibition which has just gone live on his website again last week of the 40 paintings that he created along the way and I really tried to um, show George as well the importance of having more access features on your website so we've had some audio description created for that particular online exhibition which you can listen to on his website. I work with a really wonderful audio describer called Harry Baxter uh, in London and he's done several things on my own website as well as for the shift website that I do. Uh, as part of my freelance role, I also mentor disabled artists. So I get my own Arts Council funding to do several different projects that I'm really passionate about. So through that, several, uh, 22 artists were mentored last year by other mentors that I paired them with and I supported each artist and took notes for each artist. And that was really important. And I'd like to get funding to continue that. But on the side of that, I work with the Arts and Health Hub, which is this picture you can see here. And last year they got funding to support three artists, three disabled artists um, at the beginning of their careers. And I was paired with a queer neurodivergent uh, young artist in London. And I worked with her for four months. On a weekly basis, we'd have conversations. We'd talk about how she, how she wanted to move forward, things she wanted to do. We've also just submitted a funding application and when the four months were up, I really didn't want to stop working with this particular individual because I'd built such a lovely rapport with them and I don't feel like it's right just to drop people. So I still talk to them now on a monthly basis, catch up with them. They send me anything they want me to check. Um, I send them opportunities if I ever see anything suitable to them. And so, as I said, we've just submitted a funding application uh, that got, um, that got, selected for a develop your creative practice so she's just starting on her journey of her funding and getting mentoring and building up um, her project which is all to do with mental health and raising awareness and um, ADHD. I'm just looking at something that's gone into the thing how you think the main gallery is represented okay we'll come to that in a minute. Um, the thing on the right is arts emergency. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of this. It's kind of quite national now and they support young people who are facing difficulties within the arts. And through that, I've been paired for a year with a young artist with ME, um, who is simply wonderful. She had to drop out of school because of her ME um, and so has no qualifications. So she really wants to become an artist and, and um, start to develop that side of things. So every month we meet up and talk about different things and actually she's never had a CV. So we've been building a CV together. We've been talking to other artists, learning new arts-based skills, looking at their website and how to develop it and how to really profile their artwork more through it. So again, that's something that's really important to me. And then I think my final slide um, is how I collaborate with other disability arts organizations. So I touched on the fact that I work quite closely with the Arts and Health Hub. I also work quite closely with lots of the supported studios all over the UK um, because I've been working with them ever since I used to manage the National Arts Charity. So some of them I've known for over 10 years now. And I do many projects with lots of them and uh, DANK is the Disabled Artist Networking Community. I came across them in Manchester a couple of years ago and before lockdown they used to do regular meetups and I was um, invited as an industry guest to give a presentation to um, all of the disabled artists that attend their meetings alongside lots of other industry professionals that go to them. And during lockdown they got some funding to really develop the visual art side of what they do. So Dank was set up by um, two people that are more uh, performance based or theatre based. They do acting on the television. And there was very few visual artists that were kind of coming to the sessions. And obviously that's what I specialize in. So during lockdown, they started to attract more and more artists. So we did a couple of Zoom sessions, uh, one in the morning and one later in the day so to suit different people's uh, timing needs. And we really talked about what sort of things people wanted 
uh, in order to move forward within the visual arts side of things so that we could really tailor design a package that was suited to the audience that we were working with. So from that first lot of funding, we did five sessions. Two of them were creative based. So I've got disabled artists to run creative sessions online for anyone that wanted to attend them. And then three of them were skills based. So lots of people wanted to know more about Instagram and how to use it to their to their best. Um, this was an event. What is the role of a curator and how best to approach them? This was a really popular event that we put on because lots of the artists had questions around you know, how do I even approach people when I can't even leave the house, I can't network at events because my anxieties are raised. And then the third event was about writing an artist statement and a curator at a gallery led that event and talked people through the best things to include in your artist statement and how to make it accessible. And we pulled together like a PDF after that that we could circulate to people about the kinds of things that would be good to put into your CV. So they've just got some funding um, again from the Arts Council to continue that side of things. So we're just programming in um, for the next season, three more creative sessions for visual arts based artists. So do look out for those. Should they be of interest, they'll be advertised through the Dank website and through my um, social media as well. Just want to come back to Claire's question that's come in there. That I touched on it a bit more about what you think, how about how main galleries represent disabled and neurodivergent artists. Uh, I don't think many of them really do. Um, there's lots of conversations that I'm part of at the moment. I find it quite frustrating, as do many of the artists that I've talked to, that um, with disabled and neurodivergent artists, it's often seen as a community thing. Um, or they're put in touch with the education team. So if their work gets shown in those spaces, it's often within the learning department or it's downstairs, around the corner, next to the toilets. And it's never given, in my opinion, the promotion and recognition that it deserves because I think it deserves to be in the main gallery spaces. And frustratingly, my black and white show um, that I created last year, the Arts Council asked me to tour that would be wonderful if I could get it to tour and I actually got five mainstream spaces to sign up to have it in their main gallery spaces for three months for each of them and the Arts Council just turned it down which is more than a little annoying to say the least uh, when they say that they're crying out for that sort of thing and it's not happening but what's been really uh fantastic recently is that you may have seen that Project Artworks, which is a charity that's based in Hastings, that works with neurodiverse artists and makers, they were up for the Turner Prize this year, which is absolutely massive. So they've got their work at the Herbert in Coventry at the moment as part of the Turner Prize exhibition, which is just incredible to have those kind of artists shown in that kind of space. I'm also currently part of um, a network that's working with the, uh, I'm working with the Plus Tate Network, which is a network of lots of big organizations around the country, um, including the Tate that are part of those discussions. And I posed the question to them about, you know, why are you not showing the work of disabled artists within your spaces? And can we start talking about solutions about how you're going to change this? So, so far we've had three meetings um, I'm doing this with Dank. We've had three meetings with these organizations where we, in the first meeting, we looked at some of the barriers. And in the second and third meeting, I brought three disabled artists into the conversation as well, because I feel like it's important that they are heard. And we talked about some of the barriers that came up and potential solutions or ways to navigate moving forward and trying to see how these organizations can really work more with disabled artists, program them more into their space, diversify their work teams and that sort of thing. Um, but to date, I think that um, big galleries really are not doing enough uh, to support these artists or aren't really showcasing their work in the ways that I feel that it should be. I did mention earlier as well, I wanted to mention about the deaf side of things. I've just been part of an Arts Council funded project called Signs of Art that you can see on my website, working with um, Rebecca, who's the lady that does the BSL for my website. 
And we researched into lots of the big galleries websites, the big museums websites, and there is no BSL. You have to dig on some of them, dig quite far to even find the accessible information. And for someone who cannot, who's, whose first language isn't English, it's BSL, they wouldn't even be able to get to that information in the first place to find the small BSL that some websites had. But on the whole, a lot of the websites did not have um, accessible information for deaf people. And when we were then researching with deaf audiences, you know, do you, how often do you go to exhibitions and that sort of thing? Many of them said that they very rarely went because they couldn't find out the information that they needed to find out about, you know, who the artist actually was, the opening hours, you know, very basic information or just a bit of information to entice them to see that show. And they said that if they couldn't find that information in the first place, they didn't really want to go and see it because they knew that they weren't going to be catered for when they got to that space, which I found incredibly sad and really eye-opening, which is why to me, I try and do as much BSL as I can across all of the projects that I work with, because I'm really trying to make it more accessible to all audiences so that they feel that they're welcome to my website and to any events that I put on. I'm just gonna check on. I mean, I think just what, what you're saying really is, 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 is kind of, you know, what we're putting on online talks and, and it's kind of what we're aspiring to is to make, make you know, that accessibility better as well. I mean, we're all sort of learning, mm -hmm. um, but it's absolutely something that we aspire to, to just, you know, it just becomes, um, you know, a regular thing, it's always there. And that to me is how it should be. Yeah. Um, and it's incredible really, isn't it? That we're still having to sort of fight well, to-, to Horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's crazy um and, and you seem like what you're doing is absolutely amazing um and that you're doing it on your own is doubly amazing I just don't know how you you, you seem to be doing it all on your own I um, do <laughs> except for my parents pouring yeah, drinks at my right. openings <laughs> yeah. um, have you have you come across any other galleries or anybody that do that's doing sort of a similar thing to you, or is, you know, striving um, towards the same sort? I mean, of lots of the studios that I work with are all striving for the same thing, and they'd love for their mm -hmm. artists to be recognised. There's um, one of my friends uh, runs a really wonderful organisation in America called Summertime Gallery, and they were set up to make the art world more inclusive to neurodivergent people. And so they've been, they've bought us, uh, they rent a small space out um, in Williamsburg and they've had residences in that space from neurodivergent artists. And then they put on some sort of exhibition or something that the, at the end that the artist wants. They uh, run weekly sessions online where artists can drop in, neurodivergent artists can drop in and be part of sessions together and feel less isolated. They have meetups where the artists can go around different galleries together and talk about art together. They have a really wonderful program that they run. They're in America. <laughs> um, but it's, it, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to um, navigate this art world. There's very few people that are really dedicated to it. There's lots of amazing disability arts organizations in this country, uh, like Disability Arts Online, are doing incredible things, commissioning lots of disabled artists to do different projects and celebrating their work through their website. There's Dash, um, which is run by a guy called Mike. He's done so much mentoring throughout lockdown with artists that are, were really isolated and wondering what the hell they were doing. And he did so much mentoring, just, just him by himself <laughs> half the time, mentoring so many incredible artists. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's we're very few and far between, I find. But the ones that do it, I think, are doing it absolutely exceptionally. Yeah. Um, it's it's trying to challenge people. So when you're working with like these big museums and galleries, the first thing they say that's a barrier for them is funding and the costs of things. But then when you start to have the conversations with them, you say, but actually, do you know how much BSL costs? Like, do you know how much it costs to produce an easy read? Because actually it's not as expensive as you think it is, but they've already ruled it out because they've already decided it is too expensive. 
And I kind of say, if I can do it and I work by myself with very minimal funds, I mean, I went on an easy read training course myself and now I produce my own easy reads, um, which lots of organizations could do. They could send people on training courses to produce them. But for me, it, it doesn't matter how much it costs. Like with BSL, whenever I've done an online talk even if there's not been anyone there that needed bsl at the time i've paid for it because then i've recorded it into the talk so that when it goes on my website if someone wants to watch it afterwards that's deaf they can still follow the talk um, because there's a transcript available and there's also the bsl embedded into the talk so for me i'd rather pay the 140 pounds to have the bsl put onto it rather than not make it accessible to that particular audience. But for lots of museums and galleries, they don't think it's going to be 140 pounds. They think it's going to thousands and thousands of pounds. It, it, it's That's incredibly frustrating that they've already made their mind up on these things. And that's what these conversations I'm having at the moment with these bigger organizations is trying to be like, let's stop second guessing and let's actually look yeah. at the costs of these things. Um. I mean, do you have any exhibitions coming up? Um, obviously. Um, uh, yeah, I did. I did mean to mention that. Um, this was my final slide. This is me looking very cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I've written down what I, I said. This is me. I might not be rich and famous, but I'm really happy and I love what I do. Um, this was outside my first ever exhibition in London. It was literally on for three days because that's all I could afford when I first started. My parents gave me 500 pounds to hire out a space for three days in London. And I was like, I promise you, I will pay you back. They came down, my dad made me this sign and painted my logo on it. The, one of my friends came and served the drinks. A friend of mine built my website for free. Another friend was a photographer and came and took some photos for free. Um, I called on lots of favors for people that I've worked with from across the years. And if you're really passionate about something, like people really believe in you and they want to help you. And so I've said, like, get a strong, supportive network of people around you. Follow your gut. Always ask questions and seek advice. Stay true to yourself. And also, like, you're allowed to be sad when things get rejected. And, you know, allow yourself that time to feel sad I get rejections all the time from funding applications and stuff and I still feel crap afterwards but then it's like okay I'm gonna feel sad for a day but actually then I'm gonna pick myself back up because I love what I do and I want to move forward with this um so yeah oh yeah that was what I'm gonna say so my next exhibition <laughs> is in Margate um yeah. so Robert Diamond who's the other guy from the podcast runs um, is the director of the Carl Friedman Gallery in Margate which is a beautiful contemporary art space three big rooms and once I'd been on their podcast he then said we'd love to do an exhibition with you basically here's our space you can have it for like nine weeks to do whatever you want so it's going to be a show of 17 disabled and self-taught artists from around the world. Uh, 13 of them are my artists, four are other artists that I really admire that work out of supported studios. There's going to be um, some talks, a BSL tour. Um, one of the artists, Naina, that works out of Action Space in London is going to come and do some live drawing in the space, which I think is going to be phenomenal. Um, so yeah, that's my next exhibition. It will open on the 29th of January until the 3rd of April in Margate. So if anyone is able to travel, please do. But if you're not able to travel, there is going to be a tour that's filmed that will go onto my website um, for anyone that can't get there. Because I understand that some of the artists around the world will obviously not travel <laughs> to Margate, but I want them to be able to um, see it and stuff. So yeah. Fantastic. Um... I, I'm just I'm so, I'm so in awe of you like I I don't know I know we've we've kind of spoken over email about doing this tour um but I don't think I realized to the extent of I mean you can absolutely tell how much you love doing what, what you're doing um that yeah. really really just come across and um it's just incredible um yeah I, I'm, I'm very I'm passionate kind of like, about it, yeah 
yeah, I'm kind of lost for words, really, because you've really sort of blown me away. Oh, um, and I often, I, I think I become, I'm one of those people that sometimes I feel like I get a bit too involved, like, especially with some of the artists in this country, I've got, I'm so fond of the artists that I work with, and I'm so passionate about their work. And um, yeah, they, I, they kind of sometimes say things and it brings you like, it reminds me why I do things. So I, I wrote down something that Terence said in a talk recently. It might make me cry when I say it actually. <laughs> he said, I'd rather have Jennifer um, than win the lottery because I've already won the lottery having her in my life. She's been instrumental in my life and building my confidence back up and I can't thank her enough. Mm-hmm. And then you hear things like that and you think, that's why I do what I do. I'm not yeah. doing it to make loads of money. I'm doing it because I'm really passionate about these artists. I'm passionate that they start to get recognized, that the art world changes, that they start to get programmed into you know, big spaces, that these spaces work with the access needs of the artists that we work with and really you know, listen to their needs, listen to how things need to be if like quiet spaces need to be created, they need to create them. It needs to be a suitable space Mm -hmm. for these people to be able to attend, but there also needs to be this online element so that those people that cannot make it still feel that they are a part of what it is. And I feel like there's such a long way to go still, and I'm really prepared and driven to kind of see this through and really challenge people. And yeah, very passionate. It's amazing. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, we're nearly at time. If anyone's got any questions um, really quickly for, uh, for Jennifer. Um, oh, hang on. I think there might be one that's come in. Um, one from Julian. Hi, Julian. Um, I agree with everything you say, particularly with regards to the difficulties faced by neurodivergent artists. When you really struggle with day-to-day conversation, how on earth are you meant to be heard within an art world? where being an accomplished operator in a highly socialised environment seems increasingly like the only pathway to success. Um, <laughs> it feels like it's yeah. easier to fly to the... There's so yeah. many people, Julian, will say that. And when I got these curators to come and talk, and obviously artists were saying to them, you know, if I'm an anxious artist, if I don't like being in crowded spaces, you know, how am I meant to get noticed by you in comparison to all these other people? And so these, some of the curators were saying that they welcome people to write to them, but they kind of say, if they were from like an independent gallery space or something, their advice was really look at the gallery or museum that you're contacting to check that your work is relevant to the work that they program, to the work that they do, to the other artists they work with before you even write to them. Because if you're not relevant, they're more than likely, as harsh as it is, not going to respond to you because they think that you haven't done your homework. Whereas you, if you reach out with an email, maybe with a simple PDF, with a few images um, and state like why you're contacting them and why you think you're relevant um, and why you'd like to have a conversation with them they're more likely to respond to things like that I'm also really um, challenging through these talks I'm doing that more curators go to visit supported studios and that sort of thing because they're more than willing to go to you know artist studios dotted around Manchester or something but then why aren't they then willing to go to the Learning Disability Arts Studio in Manchester, which is still a studio. They still work with a large number of artists. It just seems like they're not quite there yet to go to that space. And I'm really challenging them on that and really trying to push them to be like, you know, it is still an art studio. They are still artists and they deserve you coming to spend a bit of time with them and looking at what they do. Um, And that doesn't go for Manchester. I'm just because I live in Manchester. That's an example that I'm giving. It happens um, everywhere. But I completely see what you're saying, Julian. There's also um, Dash run this wonderful program, which they've got funding for to run again, where they've um, been pairing disabled artists with institutions like a guy that I know called Aidan was paired with Mima in Middlesbrough to be trained as a disabled curator to try and diversify the workforce. And it's really interesting when you hear some of the outcomes of the three that would that happened for the first lot I think they're about to take on six more artists about how it only seems to be disabled curators that program disabled artists work and that was a really interesting outcome that I talked to some people about and now they're trying to challenge that 
and also accentuate um i've just got a massive um, over a million pounds part of funding to have disabled people uh, go into um, different institutions across the country for either similar things to be curators or to do smaller fellowships, which are a smaller amount of time. Again, to challenge what's being showcased in these places and to really bring disability to the forefront. So I recommend that people look at those particular two things because they're really quite important things that are happening quite now that uh, now that I've got a lot of money pumped into them. Um, Julian's uh, also popped in with a question in. He asks, do you think that the art world has low expectations of disabled artists, mirroring the equally low expectations we have of uh, disabled people generally? Um, I hate to say it, but on the whole, I think so. And from through this project shift um, that I've done, when I've been having conversations with learning disabled artists, they think that uh, they, they think that the art world has a very low expectation of them and they're, they're said they're there to kind of disrupt that and challenge that but they already know before they've even gone into something that someone's already got a low expectation of them and I think that is a horrendous thought to have before you've even gone into something that they already are aware that someone thinks so poorly of them um, so I would say that is quite a big thing that lots of people feel and I do think it's true. Not from me. No. <laughs> that, that um, but on, on, on the whole, um, and that's why we really need to stand up for disabled artists and neurodivergent artists and challenge these bigger institutions about what they program, how they program it, you know, the capabilities that they think these artists have. Um, because again, stereotypes are still huge in this country and for disabled artists, I think, if you go to the other talks that are programmed, I'm sure Tony and Tanya will say similar things about how disabled artists are still seen in this day and age and how difficult it is to challenge people, but how we must continue. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, is there anything else you want to add um, before we go, Jennifer? I mean, um, good... Not really. Yeah, I hope some really good advice there. I think um, you know. I hope everyone's enjoyed that. <laughs> Listening to what I do, do look at my website, my social media. You'll find way more out about what I do. But that kind of gives a snapshot. Um, but like I said, I'm very passionate about what I do and the artists that I work with, and I really want to see change, and it needs to happen now. It does. It does absolutely. Please don't stop doing what you're doing. Is all I, <laughs> I won't. <laughs> I'm young. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a few um, thank yous coming there. Thank, thanks very much. And, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, Jennifer, as I say, I'll repeat again, you've just been wonderful. I, I think lots of galleries can learn um, so much from the way you operate and your ethos and your passion, I think that, that can't be learned. Obviously that's, that's ingrained in what you do. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that at home. Uh, next just just to clarify, because someone's yeah. just asked, um, my last name is Gilbert, but my middle name uh, is Lauren. So that's, it's Jennifer Lauren, yeah. because I thought it sounded nicer than Jennifer Gilbert <laughs> for my website. Um, so that's where the Lauren comes into it. It's my middle name. Okay, great. Um, just before we go, our next Arts Fest Online event is a collaboration with the Black Country Studies Centre at the Black Country Living Museum. And that is tomorrow, Tuesday, the 7th of December at 7pm with historian and researcher Simon Briatis and Professor of Labour and Social History, Keith Gildart. And they will be discussing the working class history of the Black Country. You can book for free through the Black Country Living Museum website. Hope to see you there. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm from Birmingham, so I like the Black Country Living Museum. Oh, <laughs> many, many a time when I was young spent at the Black Country Living Museum. Well, <laughs> oh, fantastic. You've yeah. totally lost your accent. Uh, I don't know. I think it, it creeps back in there sometimes. <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't detect it on the signal. Good. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.